Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, my name is Nitin. Uh, I am the CTO and co-founder of Selector. So I'm, I'm going to go into the deep dive uh, into the platform. And uh, this, is the, this is the agenda for my session. Um, so as, as we said, a big problem for network operators is there's a lot of data. And what you would want to do is correlate all of that data and tell me what to do. Right? It's, a, it's a simple enough problem. And everyone understands it. Um, but this is problem hasn't been solved for years, right? That's why we've existed and we've we've solved this problem. So at the end of the session, my the, my, my goals for the session are three things. First, I want to give an I want to tell you um, why this problem is hard. There are certain aspects of a simple problem. What are the hard parts about it? Because if this problem hadn't been hard, it would have been solved years ago, right? It's still it's still work in progress. The problem is hard. What has Selector AI done to solve that problem? Right? Like we have made certain design decisions. Kubernetes adoption was one of that. What have we done to solve those problems? And third, what is the user experience? Like, yeah, you want to correlate and stuff. What is the end user experience? How does a user consume a product? Like if you were using Uber, you know the user experience. You, you, you open the Uber app and you're up and running. That's the taxi cab calling experience Uber provided. What is the user experience that Selector, what Selector does? And of course, stop me anytime for any questions. So the user experience. This is a user experience to start with. Everything is Slack native, right? So um, before, let, let me give some background to this. This is an example of a data center operator who operates a spine leaf uh, fabric. And you have a lot of spines. You have a bunch of leaves. And then you have servers which are running applications. That is a very simplistic scenario uh, that the that the demo is based upon. And um, when this infrastructure is running, applications are probably having issues. Whatever, something happens. What is the day in the life of such an operator? Right. So this is not the onboarding part that you had asked. This is things have been onboarded, things are working, selector is deployed. And what what happens after that? Right. So as Deba mentioned, we are a Slack native company. Right. Which what what it means is you can consume a lot of most of the important parts of our product via Slack. You don't have to go to a dashboard. We do have dashboards, right? But you can do a most of your stuff on, on Slack. So tier one teams, uh, they can do things on Slack. And when I say Slack, I mean Microsoft Teams also, everything, because every organization has an official policy of using Microsoft Teams, but they shadow IT, they always use Slack, right? And <laughs> Is being spoken. <laughs> so, so we do support both, even for our customers who do Microsoft Teams, we have a Slack integration. So the Selector AI app is available in the Slack marketplace. If you search for us, it will be there. We are, uh, we are an app in, in, Microsoft, in the Azure marketplace as well. So, and this is a bet, again, we, put the, we, we placed a bet on this four years ago when we started the company. And we didn't know COVID is going to come. Uh, we, we felt that um, something like an enterprise communication tool has got to be the way these things have to be consumed, right? Because it's hard to do dashboards. Plus, as a product, it gets hard, right? Now, if I say my product is available on Slack, everybody sort of kind of gets it, right? So that, that's the, uh, that's the uh, important thing. So now you're on Slack. So really, it's all alert, alert driven. So this is, this is an alert that a Slack operator gets. So first, it's an alert on, on Slack. And this alert is, is not a dump of information. It has got something which is actionable. And it tells you by just looking at it really what happened. Right? You don't know the details of it. But like you know, at, at a 10,000 foot view, you know that this person called Joe, he's made, he or she, he's made some configuration change. And that has caused certain protocols to go down. You, there's a summary over there. Simple English looking sentence, but there's a lot of technology that has gone there to build that sentence. And then the devices that are affected, there are two devices, a spine leaf 4, a leaf switch 150. Those devices have been affected. Um, the BFD sessions have gone down. And the two applications that are most likely to be affected are Office 365 and mail and video. Made up example, but you know, um, in real life, this looks a little more detailed and a little more complicated. But the concepts are all explained over here. Just coming right out, finger pointing right away. It's definitely Joe. Right. 
<laughs> right then. Yes. <laughs> and definitely, it's important uh, information. I, I'm, I'm giving it a hard right, time, but right. I don't want to be Joe if this message comes across yeah. Slack. And and then uh, you probably are running thousands of applications, right? Uh, those applications haven't been affected. Only your video application and 365. So your search space has been pruned a lot. Yeah. You don't have to look at all the Leaf devices. You only have to look at those two. You have to start there, right? You have a starting point. That's what Deba said. Um, in any outage, it is the triage which takes 90% of the time. If you know what happened, uh, like where it happened, fixing it is not really that hard. Right, it's it's the that's the easy part. Uh, I've written code a lot, debugging the code using a debugger that I spend most of the time. The fix is probably a line, right? And I'm like, I spend the whole week fixing this plus five to plus six or something like that. Character, right? Some, <laughs> yeah. Right. So this piece of information, however trivial it looks, this is the uh, this is how our product works, and I'll I'll do the demo as well. Yeah, there is. So this is the thing, and stuff is going to happen on Slack. And then there is that portal link as well. So if you want, like somebody would want to get more information out of it, you click on that portal link and then and you can go more um, debugging. Is there some sort of alert suppression that's happening when you're doing mm -hmm. the correlation so that you're not sending a whole bunch of different Slack messages, you're sending one that's got all the correlated information? That's what I want to show. Okay. Right, so I'm going to try something, which is I'm going to do the I'll, I'll do a part of the demo now, just to show show this aspect. Right, so this is this is that Slack channel um, where stuff is happening. I took a screenshot from here, so I'll just so assuming an alert had fired, right? And assuming an alert had fired, and and this and this in this case that 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 alert happened earlier. Uh, that was the alert that happened, and, and there's another another instance of this. I see this alert, and I want to just quickly figure out more what's going on, right? So I, I could be on my mobile. So first of all, since I'm Slack, I already have access to this application on my mobile phone right away, right? So I'm going to, so I, assuming I saw this alert, I'm going to ask for more information. So slash select is our keyword on Slack. So I'm going to say status of devices. So I just typed, I just typed that command on my on my Slack client, and I should see the, I've, the result of that over here. So I, I typed it on my phone. I said status of my devices, and I don't I don't I don't have to remember what is the exact command. How do I pull out all the device status? As soon as I typed it on my phone, I see this, and you can see these are my devices. If you look, if you're managing infrastructure, you know certain devices are red. Red means bad, green means good. And other people who are on your team right away see all of this application. Whoever, those nine people on, 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 the, on the channel over there, they are certainly they have the access to this information. I can keep typing over here. I'm going to say select. Now I know a certain device is bad. I want to get more detail around it. Like I know the device is bad, but what about the device is bad? So select status. So I know I know the device called L150 is bad. I want to see what's going on over here. So I, I've typed it again on my on my mobile phone, and uh, and the status of that device is going to show up over here. This is primarily the user experience for. And so here, you know, the chart is not very clear, but different things about the devices show up over here. The logs that happened on the device, uh, the status of all the ports on the device, everything shows up over here. And I can keep, can keep going there. Now, maybe I'm back on my computer, or somebody else has already is all, one of my team members is already on this computer. They're already seeing all of this, so they can go back. So let's let me go back to this link. I saw this alert, and I want to go back and see what was the information at that point in time. So now let's let's see the technology that we had built to to get uh, to get to this view. So how how this was built, uh, what needs to, what what happened. So this is the this is the pipeline. I'm I'm going to walk walk through this pipeline. There's a bunch of data processing things that happen. What we just saw on Slack is the far right. You saw that the the alerts were formed. Uh, the alerts were were described in a certain way, and it gives the impression that we we just a Slack gimmick. It's not. 
right? Because the information is, is, is hard to curate. And how do you get there? That's where the, the technology lies. So that's where the, the eventual goal is. I'm going to walk, walk you over there. And these are the raw metrics. Starting from the, from the left, the metrics are coming in, right? So first the met metrics come in. And as I said earlier, that these metrics are different kinds of metrics. They could be ping mesh metrics. They could be SNMP metrics. So you've, you've configured them. These metrics come in. And the logs that are coming in, or events are coming in, different kinds of streams are coming into your system. So we accept all of those connectors. Once those connectors come into it, we put them into a common data lake that we host. Right? So this is still raw metrics. Uh, this is what we cannot afford to store for months. Right? This is just the raw metrics, and that's why uh, they're shown in, uh, in white. But the key part is they are sitting in a common data store. They are not siloed. The initial metric sources were siloed, but they, they are brought into one data store. So that's the first technological challenge that we've solved. Getting these different forms of data into one storage, it's harder than you would think. Right? And that's why silos exist today, because people will have a metric store, people would have a log store, and they just live side by side. So one dashboard for this, one dashboard for this. You already brought them together. First, the first challenge that, that's been solved. But now, if you want to do anything with this data, it is computationally infeasible, because there are millions and millions of data points. If you started to analyze each one of them, there's no amount of compute that will solve for that, right? because you just cannot you just cannot write good enough software uh, that is going to do all of that. So, th so what we then do is using ML to convert these white numbers and sentences into reds and greens. Right? Green means things are good, red means things are bad. And our assumption is, which I think is a fairly good assumption, that we don't have to really correlate between the, the greens. We can throw away the greens throw away the greens, greens from a correlation point of view momentarily. We don't have to worry about the greens. So then, once we've done, we've thrown away the greens, now we're left with only the reds, right? Now the volume of data that our software, that part of our software has to look at, is significantly reduced, right? Sometimes it gets reduced by 99%, right? Because in a given period of time, there are only so many bad things can happen, right? So even a thousand red events, but you had a billion good events, right? So we've converted them into, we've, we've sifted out the reds, right? Once you have the reds, now you need to start clustering them together. Like all, all some events could be just um, unrelated. Yeah, the bad, bad event, Joe configured over here, but something that happened over here is not related over there. That's where part of the correlation uh, algorithm comes into play. We call it collaborative filtering. And I'll, I'll describe more about that, how that happens. So you start forming these clusters. Right? So to answer your question, if there were alerts on the reds, you will see so many alerts. Sure. Because you, you had a thousand things that went bad, you would have seen thousand uh, alerts. Now, because of the collaborative filtering clustering that we do, the bunches get formed. Like the thing that I showed you on Slack, there was uh, a cluster that was formed. And now there are only two clusters that got formed and two alerts got generated. And we call those, al so first of all, these two alerts that get generated, the user doesn't have to configure them. Because the system is already looking for bad behavior, and it, it, it clusters the bad behavior together, and then sends over as problems to alerts. That's the pipeline. I'm gonna go into deep, deep into each part of the pipeline to explain how that is. Uh, how are uh, thresholds for what's good and bad determined, and do customers have an ability to customize that, or would you even want customers to have the ability to customize Right, right. Uh, I'll describe that. Uh, we, customers don't want to configure that, right? Uh, our, system does, uh, our system uses unsupervised learning, machine learning, to get to what is good and bad. I, I'll describe all of that. So you're taking baselines? Yes, we're so taking baselines. Okay. Right. But you could have management software, for example, that appears to be an anomaly because of its behavior with contacting multiple devices. So it seems like it'd be a good idea to allow them to tune. So yeah, so there is, there is human uh, uh, after the fact that you can say, yeah, you've discovered this cluster. I don't want you to take into account 
uh, this in the future, right? So there is some amount of human learning. But when I said we don't want our customers to do that, 99% of the time, they, we don't want them to be involved because it puts additional burden on them and sometimes they don't know. But for certain aspects when they do know, which we call rules to you know, prune your correlations, that uh, ability is there. So <clears throat> maybe the elephant in the room uh, in talking about a solution like this mm -hmm. is that that correlation is an incredibly challenging uh, process. Right. You know that, you yeah. have the tool, right? Yeah. Um, the, my question to you, are, are you doing analysis on the accuracy like statistical analysis on the accuracy of what that ML is coming up with and constantly revising that. And like, what does that look like? Like, how are you ensuring that you're getting the best possible data out of there? You're not going to tell us how you do it. And I'm not asking you. To. Right, right, right. But I'm like, how are you looking at that? Because I, I imagine there have to be false positives, false yes, negatives yes, that come out yes. of this. So what does that look like? So we, we've built a feedback loop. Like if I'm discovering this correlation for you, uh, there is a browse interface to that. And then you can say uh, bad alert, good alert, something like that. So that feedback the human does, and then th that feedback is then looped into the, the correlations phase, and then it knows that I don't need to be correlating that. That is one aspect of the feedback. Same thing applies for the baselining aspect, that yes, you said this is a threshold violation, but you know this really is not, it's expected. So there are, um, there are things around seasonality that we've built, that yes, I expect things to go up, uh, uh, at these times of day. So we, we, we do all of that as well. Okay. Does that um, feedback filter out to other customers of the products? Or is that each entity kind of like has their own bit of training that happens around what is and what isn't? It is a mixture of both, okay. right? It is a mixture of both. Certain things that we do for one customer uh, does benefit the other customers. Like for example, this log line is bad. This log line is really, uh, uh, you know, is is harmless, although it looks harmful. They're being verbose and right, yeah, yeah, right. So stuff like that does uh, uh, transfer from one deployment to the other, and so sometimes some things others don't. Like seasonality in our uh, video provider has one kind of seasonality. The seasonality that we see uh, in a different deployment is very different. So there it is uh, tuned over there. Okay. So, so to follow up on that, then, so if in each individual's customer deployment there is obviously a period of time of data ingestion and then training the AI model specific to that customer with limited preloaded uh, you know, intelligence from your broader customer base. Yes. How long in a typical customer are you seeing to get to time to value? Oh, so we've been very cognizant of that, that observation, right? As a startup, we cannot walk into a customer and say, I'm going to train for a year before I show value, right? So we knew that uh, if you look at traditional ML models, um, that's what we're going to go after, right? And non-starter. So we've used, and so, that, so we said, okay, we have to compromise a little bit, right? Yes, we will, we will train the models more aggressively, which look at lesser amounts of data, and maybe then a little bit more fo false positives, we'll prune those away. It's, it's an engineering compromise. So for us, when we, we take a day to show them value, like, you know, this, look, you had these latency values. I'm able to tell you what is, what is good or what is bad. Uh, you gave me all of these logs that came in. I was able to cluster them uh, based on what I've learned from other deployments or from your deployment. Within a day, we are able to show value. With respect to ML, right? Generally speaking, our product, there is a pilot phase before the goes to deploy. Our POCs run for 30 days, generally 30 days is enough a value that they see, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll show you examples of that, where that, that helps. Thank you. So let's, let's now let's go through different parts of this pipeline and, and show uh, what, what, what goes on. So the first part is data ingestion. So I'm, if you see on the, on the top right corner, I'm, I'm walking, walking through the pipeline and showing different aspects of the pipeline. So there are Data ingestion has two important properties that you have to solve for. First, you have to build enough connectors for different kinds of da uh, data sources, right? There are, there are a few categories of data sources that you have to um, build for. Uh, customers let you connect to direct devices, or there are message buses in the middle that you connect to, or you connect to data stores. Somebody has already stood up uh, a Splunk, somebody's already stood up a Prometheus, 
you connect to that. So you need to be able to connect to these three different kinds. Right? Each of them requires different kind of technology that you have to build. There is no one size that fits all. You have to do all of this. And then, of course, there are cloud providers, right? Cloud providers have uh, cloud providers have APIs uh, uh, that you can connect to. You have as long as you have the credentials and all that, uh, they give you API access, right? Now, we need to be able to uh, ingest a given new piece of data uh, in minimal amount of time. So, what we call is you there has to be minimal time to uh, integrate new connectors. We've realized there's no universal data format. Every data format looks different. Uh, there is no universal. And there is no way customers or uh, people will arrive at something which is uniform. So we embrace that fact. Like, instead of having to write custom Python parsing code to take this data, we've invested in a compiler. We've built a, this is, this is one of our patents that we've, we filed that we built this compiler, which you, we've written once, as and when a new data source comes in, you just feed that schema to the compiler and this compiler generates code. And then that code ex executes, right? So our time to integrate and parse a new data format that we haven't ever seen is as fast as this compiler can run, which is seconds, right? You don't have to write new code, you don't have to deploy it, you don't have to do anything, right? So this compiler uh, we've built, we internally call this compiler the data hypervisor, and the name hypervisor came from the compute world. Just like hypervisors abstracted disk, drive, network, storage from the application, this compiler abstracts out the data variety that our applications have to see. So, so um, that, that compiler that is, is built, that's one aspect of the data ingestion. The second aspect are these three things, and this is, this is how do you do high volume data ingestion? The, the difference between ingesting operational metrics and business intelligence data is around scale. There's so much scale involved in ingesting that data that just, just doesn't exist for other kind of BI tools. We do a lot of analytics. Yes, the, the slicing and dicing of dashboards, the slack, that is common to the BI world, but in the operational world where we all live, how do you deal with giant uh, fire hoses of data? So there are three important problems to be solved in this space. First is, you have to have a scalar architecture because data volume generally starts uh, small and it grows gradually over a period of time. So your architecture needs to elastically be able to use more compute resources, more storage, more, uh, more whatever, right? So as I said earlier, we've, we've adopted Kubernetes. So all of this comes naturally, right? We start small at a, at a deployment and suddenly we grow. It's just a matter of tuning the Kubernetes environment to, to a large cluster, that's the one part. Second part is, so much data comes in, you, we need an internal data distribution architecture. Like we've ingested all of this data, but this data has to be distributed inside our system as well. If you were to take like a, a router or a chassis, there's a fabric inside, which takes in traffic from different ports and distributes to different ports. We also have a fabric inside. We have applications, our ML applications, our baselining applications, our query applications. They need to have uniform access to that data. We have, we ourselves deploy Kafka inside our cluster. So we have a Kafka bus running where all the data comes in, we dump into Kafka, and then all our applications just suck out of Kafka. Right, so this is again, we, we put up uh, bed on Kafka. And the second is the distributed, distribute, distribute, disaggregated collection of, of data, and that's some, you had asked that earlier, that do we do, we do that? Yes, we, we have to do that, because if we are in the cloud, uh, we need to have uh, a collector on premises, which is locally polling because the administrative policies are set like that, and this is then streaming uh, up to our, our the other instance. There are two aspects of the uh, disaggregate collection that sometimes get missed. Building the collection is hard, but yes, you have to do that. But then you have to manage them also, right? Because you need to have a central place where all these collectors are present. Because if you get if you just deploy it somewhere else and then that stops working, whose responsibility is to uh, to figure out whether that remote thing is working or not? So we've paid special attention to it's yes, yeah, it's deployed, distributed, but still managed centrally. 
So these collectors, when they are installed on premises, they dial up to the master instance, they establish a control connection on which heartbeats are exchanged so that if they die locally, they can be at least, somebody can be notified or restarted. All of that needs to be taken care of. If you do not do these things, the solution is not just not gonna work. Right, so this is on the on the data ingestion part. Now let's get, get to the more interesting part. How do we how do you um, um, convert metrics and how do you correlate them? The first basic problem is metrics are fundamentally numbers, uh, just just numbers, billions and billions of numbers. Logs are English sentences, right? So if you want to correlate them together, they're apples and oranges, right? You cannot correlate them. Yeah, metric correlation itself is a hard problem, granted, but now you're looking at metrics and now you're looking at logs who are fundamentally different classes of information. Some technology has to be built to unify them. Some common currency has to be built so that you can say, ah, now I, now I, can, now I can compare these, these things. So I'm gonna talk about the technology for that. Um, how, how do we do that? I, I think it's more than this. Uh -huh. um, and one of the, the things that I think that also needs to be considered, right, is there's a lot of static elements that contribute to the analysis of our network. Things that don't change, things that don't show up in logs, things that don't show up as metrics that are kind of steady state, but have an impact on the analysis of what's going on. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. So, so how do you correlate not only disparate sets of data, because that's an incredibly challenging problem, like to your point, numbers, sentences, I'm sure there's probably 15 other, you know, ingestion formats that could exist um, beyond those two. But then, how do you how do you take into consideration the things that are static that are not generating those things? Yeah, there's, yeah. there's a context to what is taking place, yeah. right? Yes. And the context is not necessarily ingested through telemetry or SNMP. So, how to Jordan's point, how how are you making the correlation in light of that context to drive the actual yeah. insight? Yes. And Javier is sitting in the back and he pointed this out just before the presentation yesterday. You need to include metadata as well in this slide, mm -hmm. right? The metadata is, um, is a very important piece of information that generally gets missed in our system. So um, uh, since I don't have a slide description for that, we have a first class integration to metadata stores. Netbox is the most commonly uh, used store these days and we connect into Netbox we, we use the Netbox API, suck in that information, and those tables exist in the system as a data element. And as when streams is coming in, they start getting joined and they get, start getting used as well. How do you reconcile that with your strategy of ingesting all the data only as long as you need it to build insights? Are you, are you just like redoing that process on some interval? Or like, how, do, how does that work? So two, two, two parts to that. Uh, the meta stores are, not voluminous. Okay, right? you treat so, that data a little bit differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because even though we don't expose it to the users, these retention policies and how long something is stored, we, our admins do control that. So we have some amount of control where these meta stores can live forever, right? That's number one, because they're a drop in the ocean when it, when it com uh, comes to comparing with the other stuff. The other part is even these meta stores, we, we have a periodicity set to uh, you know a day sometimes, or very infrequent. And the third option is where some of us savvy customer says, hey, you just, I know when I've updated my meta store, just give me a button that uh, I know I've updated it, even I'm gonna make an API call that will call your ingest on demand, or I'm gonna log into the portal and, and do things. So combination of these three things, allow us to get in metadata into the, into the platform. Okay. So let's, let's see how, how do we do the metrics and the log stuff. So the metrics says, so this, this is the metrics pipeline. Like how do we go from numbers into a color? So on the left is you have these numbers and this, this chart that I'm showing is a, late, is a latency chart as a data set. So latency is from point X to point Y, and these latencies have different numbers. And then we have to convert these numbers into good numbers or bad numbers, right? So for example, here, a number like 174 is still considered green, good. A number like 17, which is smaller than 
uh, is still red, right? So this is where the, the ML comes into play. It says that 174 is normal for this connection. However, 17 is not normal for this connection. 56 is, it's getting closer to being abnormal. So we generally have three colors, red, yellow, and orange, although um, orange and red are considered into the same, uh, same category. So how, do, how does this, how does this uh, baselining thing work? So there are two aspects of it, as, as and when data comes in. So you'll, you'll always see in the machine learning space, there is the training pipeline which is shown at the top, and then there is the inference pipeline shown at the bottom. So the data gets fed into the training pipeline as well as the inference path. So the inference path is kind of lagging behind the, the training part. So the training part does its training, it builds its model, and makes it available to the inference pipeline. You can think of the model as a giant lookup store, like you just look up, look up into it and you get a value back, although it's not as simplistic as that. So this model in the middle is continuously being built by the, by the inference uh, store. So as data is coming in, this, inference, this, this training store is looking at data samples, it is going back in time, it is looking at whether the current data sample, uh, what is the threshold value, it, it does all of that and it starts writing into the, the model part. And then the real-time inference part is just comparing the computed threshold with the actual value and coming up with a, uh, an answer, right? So if you, if you uh, it doesn't show up on the screen. Uh, so if you see the thing on the right, there is a faded line that is sort of the baseline of the chart. And then there, is, there are these spikes in the middle. So those spikes in the middle get flagged as red lines uh, in the thing. So if you look at the behavior of the underlying metric, it's just a sea of greens, then a red, sea of greens, and a red. So that's the picture that I shown on initially that you had white things, which is just the numbers, and then because of this technology that we've built, those numbers get converted into red elements and green elements. Right? And another interesting part is the seasonality implementation over here because you know that yes, it's gonna spike up uh, at a point in time, but that spike is normal. So there is a seasonality uh, process which is running, which is looking at uh, the numbers over a larger period of time, and it recognizes that morning 8 a.m., things are gonna spike up. So it then artificially pulls up the threshold. Like, don't flag this as a red, because I've seen this uh, happen. So. We, we, we kind of look at seasonality as if you look at your if you, uh, human brain, there is a system one behavior where you look at something and you, you instant you react, right? That's what the real time baselining is. Seasonality is system two behavior that you go back and you think about it and that influences your behavior. That's a system two behavior. So uh, there are two systems which are running. They run at different, um, um, uh, swaths of data, one looks at real-time data, the other looks at more historical data. So this, this, is around, this is how, so now we have numbers, we've converted them into events, right? Now we have a red event and a green event, so that's how we converted numbers into this common currency of events. How, we have to do the same process for logs. So logs are more complicated. Uh, logs traditionally are written by developers for themselves. They think that they are going to be debugging in the field and they just write this message for themselves and there is no rhyme or reason to how the log looks like. I, I'm guilty of writing logs that only I can understand, nobody else uh, can understand. So what is, what is a log? Log is a, really a signature of a state that the original program has detected, right? Maybe the original program, some piece of code some piece of configuration that got, got into a bad state, if, like, if this state happens, print this log. That's what the, the, that piece of code is. So you, our goal as an analytics tool is to reverse engineer what that state was, right? So there are two parts to the log. So you have a log line. You need to classify this log line into what does it represent? Does this log line represent a BGP down event? Does this log line represent a BGP up event? What does this log line represent? You might have millions and millions of logs, but you probably have 100 classes of events because there are 100 conditions that have happened. BFT went down, BFT went up, uh, stuff like that, right? That's the first, first 
part of the technology that has to be built. Inside a log line, there are important entities. This log line refers to a BFD session. This log line refers to an interface. This log line re refers to an ASIN number. So in this log line, I've, we've highlighted that there is a tag called 101912, or there is a ASIN number 65101. You need to be able to infer that. Traditionally, folks have written regular expression parsers to, to get that information back. Regular expression parsers are impossible to maintain. You, the moment you write them, write them, the vendor is going to change the description in the next release, and you have to go back and change the expression. So you need, to, you need to reverse engineer from the log. This is where we use two very important pieces of machine learning technology. The first is called clustering. So you cluster all of these logs into different clusters. That's how you determine, detect the pattern. This cluster is one cluster of uh, things. This cluster is one cluster of things. That's number one. The number two is called named entity recognition, that you know that these are my entities in my system. By looking at this log line, you would be able to extract that this is an IP address, this is an ASN number. So this uh, NER is a, a well-established uh, discipline of machine learning. We've applied that to logs. All right, so once, once these two- Can you say that acronym one more time? You said NER? NER and clustering. And NER stands for what again? Named Entity Recognition. Thank you. But I, I didn't oh, give the yeah, great. explanation. Tiny letters. Even the log processing, so we call this uh, process inside our system log mining. We are mining the logs and converting them into uh, uh, signals. So logs, raw logs come in. As, as, as with the metrics, there's a training phase, and then there is an inference phase. So in the training phase, these two things happen. Tra uh, Clustering happens, uh, NER happens, and it puts that into building what's called a log model. As in when the raw logs are coming in, um, the raw logs are evaluated against that model, and then suddenly the mine logs look like every log line has an event name, and every log line has a certain set of tags. Right? So now, because of this process, we've got metrics converted into events, we've got logs converted into events. So now at some point in the stack, this piece of code, which I'm going to describe next, the correlator, the correlator doesn't know that this event was sourced because of a metric stream or this uh, thing was sourced because of a log stream. So the, the common currency has been found, determined, and we're going to now work with, with that now. So the event data model, like um, to, to understand how correlation works, uh, think of this Mickey Mouse-like thing, event thing, right? So there is an event name. <laughs> Every event has a name, and it has a set of tags, right? So in this case, for example, if you had an event called BGP down, the tags that exist for that event are what is the IP address, what is the host name, what is the ASN, what is the set? You could have any number of tags associated with an event called BGP down. There could be another event called IF down, and it has a different set of tags, because an IF down refers to an interface, what the remote interface is, right? So these are these tags. This is where the metadata uh, augmentation comes in very handy. I, when I describe those pipelines from the raw metrics and the logs, and you generate this, it goes through yet another phase where this thing is enriched with more metadata. Right, so even though your raw metric doesn't contain uh, site name or location or customer ID, all of that information would be enriched on the event. And it's very important for, for the, algorithm, the correlation algorithm to work, but it's equally, the Metastore augmentation is one of those key pieces of technology that we discovered that like fr from a technology point of view, it, we just think of it as another data store data source, but the effect that it has on our results is just tremendous. So once we know what an event model looks like, how does the, how does the, how does the correlation work? So think of correlation as, if I have an event with certain number of tags, more number of tag values that match between two events, they are correlated. Right, so in this example, if I look at event one and event three, 
there are two matching tags, the blue tag and the black tag that match. They're more strong, they're strongly correlated. Event one and event two are weakly correlated because there's only one tag that is matching green. And event three and event two are not correlated at all because there are no tags matching. Right? This is the core algorithm. Wow. And, and since we have time, I'll tell you how we arrived at this, right? Um, me and my, uh, my our chief data scientist, we were just discussing Netflix recommendation systems, right? And we were like, he was just, this, like, this is before we had done this, and he was describing to me, we were curious, because we, we share a lot of common tastes in movies, and he would say, hey, watch this movie or this, right? And I would also, on Spotify, sometimes I'd be listening to music and suddenly recommend, you should listen to this. And I'm like, how did this guy, this, this piece of software know that I like this? And then we did some research on it. Like, and we found out that every piece of movie, every piece of song can be decomposed into called features. Right? So you think of a movie, Pulp Fiction. Right? If, if a movie is Pulp Fiction, you and I understand Pulp Fiction as just a name, maybe directed by Quentin Tarantino, that's about it, right? But internally, uh, the Netflix system breaks down Pulp Fiction into thousands of attributes. Thousands of attributes. Like, this movie has a screenplay like this, this movie has this and that. So it breaks down a movie into thousand attributes. Now you take another movie, which will have another thousand attributes, and then the system just does an intersection of those attributes. So if I've liked Pulp Fiction, most likely I'm gonna like the other movie because out of those thousand attributes, 60 attributes in that movie match 60 attributes in this movie. So most likely Nathan is gonna like that movie. That's how recommendation systems work. Then we realize that that means recommendation systems are correlating these two movies, right? Pulp Fiction and Jackie Brown got correlated because of certain common attributes. So we're like, wait, we can do this with network events as well, right? If two events are heavily correlated, there must be a root cause between them. In the case of the movie system, the commonality was my choice in movies or my choice in uh, music, right? Or in, genres. Pardon me? Or genres. <laughs> yeah, right? Something, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. we, we felt that the same applies to networking events or any kinds of events, right? If they have similar attributes, there must be a root cause between them. Joe must have issued that configuration <laughs> because of which things went down. Poor Joe. Right? And we, we try, of course, when you start, you start the implementation, you, you don't, you don't, you don't believe it's gonna work, you, you want to make, we want it to work, and then we've deployed this again and again and again, and it just works. And the, the magic of this algorithm is, um, it's domain independent, right? I do not have to model the underlying domain, right? Some folks might argue that you're losing some fidelity, right? That's okay, right? Because as soon as you want to, if, as soon as you rely on understanding the domain, you become, you, you, you get embedded in it, and every network looks very different. You then have to start taking care of every nuance in the rule modeling. This thing just works. Of course, the, the premise here is tags have to be well documented. You have to have good tagging. So I'm like, let's solve that problem. It's a data problem. The rest of the world has solved that data problem. Even if the original tags are not clean, let's put in some work to solve for that, right? Because you, you can see the end result there. If I, if I solve the problem of cleaning up tags, creating more tags, it's a bounded problem. Yeah, maybe it's hard, it's a bounded problem. And that's, our, that's been one of our key differentiators as to we go into a system and a deployment and we're able to show correlations. We, don't, we sometimes don't understand um, their exact network topology. That's not important for this part of the problem. And it was inspired by Netflix and Spotify. I have to tell you, that was the best explanation I've ever heard. Seriously. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. That was great. And it's true. It's true. I'm, I'm not kidding you. Like, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a runner. You don't look at me as a runner, but I run. And Spotify plays. And sometimes it's playing music. I'm like, I don't want it. I don't I skip. And suddenly it'll play something. I'm like, yeah, I want to listen to that. And then I, yeah, this is the same, really is the same music as the other music, 
right? If, if your ear is trained to that kind of music, uh, and my daughter said the same thing, Daddy, you listen to the same kind of music all the time. Because for her, all my music sounds the same. And Spotify is just, you know, fooling me into that. Yeah. Thank you, you guys. It, it's a true story. And uh, this algorithm, uh, we, we, you want to patent it in the context of networking, but this is recommendation systems, really. But from a different point of view. So now we've correlated, right? We've gotten to 90% of the hard problem. We've gotten there. But this is not it. If you look at the machine inside, it has produced this, this massive JSON. It's, it's produced this, because if you look at the correlation, it's produced a lot of tags, it's produced a lot of information. All of that is again overwhelming to the user. This is the reverse part of the query. Like the first part I said, when, we, when I was doing my stuff on Slack, I wasn't typing in complex things. I was just saying status of application, status of it. That part of the problem of was me as a user of the system, and that's called natural language processing. I'm gonna type in English, and that converts that into something the machine understands and goes from it. This is the reverse part of the problem. The machine has produced this correlation, and for this machine, to give it back to the human, you need a separate piece of technology. It's called natural language generation. So the, the last part of our stack, which what it does, it takes this and then converts it into an, a, an English sentence. Right? Nowhere here, configuration by Joe cause. If you if you look at if look at that piece of message, that information is embedded in this JSON object. But we've not presented along those lines. And this is where a system also learns. Um, it sometimes you can, the users give us feedback about no, this is not very clear. So I need to you, we need to adjust for that. Um, so that's where a lot of the back and forth of learning happens. So now the final piece of a stack it takes in this JSON object, it then produces it into this nicely formatted thing, and then the last part is just call a uh, API to Slack and post it to Slack. Right? So again, looks very simple, like this is what the system produced, but to get to this, there were seven or eight steps that had to be done, and that's what Selector AI is about, right? We, and having come from the networking space, I knew it's not easy, right? But somebody has to build, build it, and that's what we've built. This is the thing that I'm, I'm there's light bulb for me. <clears throat> this whole table is filled with people who do this natively, through experience mm -hmm. and intuition. And what we're trying to do is to translate that into something that could be done programmatically. That's yeah. been the challenge historically. I don't even think about what we do in the context of doing this, but as you explained it, it's like, holy crap, that is something, right? Like it, it really is something of value to be able to distill down to the important part. Yeah, yeah. And, and really make that meaningful, so. Yeah, there's a, there is a simile, there's a, there's a parallel to the, when you're troubleshooting and trying to find a cause then you do more or less the same. You look at IP addresses and then you keep hopping from one device to another, from one process to another till you get there. Not with the same speed, of course. And I don't see green and red, no offense. So, <laughs> but it's a, good, it's a good way of seeing it because uh, essentially it, I don't think it's an easy thing to write uh, programmatically then or, or well, re repeat or emulate programmatically what you think. You know, the, the way you think, the train of thought, the way you correlate things. This is something you do while you're trying to figure it out what right. is breathing down your neck. It's not that it just happens there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go to the demo. I think it'll work, but that's what they tell me, but I'll, I'll check it out. <laughs> but correlation is one key aspect where uh, you know, folks say whether you do it. But there are other capabilities of our system as well, um, which, to my surprise, customer love more. I, I used to think these problems are solved. The num number one thing is no more, the, the selector becomes a single source of truth. Somebody, one of our customers used this phrase, no more swivel chair. I don't have to go look at one dashboard to the other dashboard, this. I just look at one thing and you guys tell me everything. And I don't have to go to Splunk, I don't have to go to metrics, I don't have to do any of that. Right? They are able to make queries through Slack into their own data. 
right, which they were, before selector, they were not able to get access into their own data. Like some data was trapped into the firewall, like the load balancer stacks, all of that we made available uh, through our system, right? Um, I do believe we are one of the first uh, cloud native SNMP collectors, I or a GNMI collector. I don't know of any products, products out there, or of open source, or any product out there that gives you a Kubernetes based SNMP or a GNMI collector, right? Uh, you have these products which are hardware based, uh, you have a lot of open source. Open source is hard to operationalize, it's good, but you cannot really deploy it at scale. Um, so we, we are one of the first SNMP and GNMI cloud native uh, collecting. Cloud native, what, what I mean by cloud native is Kubernetes based, right? Front end to service now. This is, this is really interesting. As you can imagine, we, ha we have a customer who said that when an outage happens, I'm more afraid of the service now bill than the actual damage caused by the outage. What happens during an outage? Thousands of alerts fire, thousands and thousands of events fire. Each of those get into ServiceNow, and guess what? ServiceNow charges them on a per event basis, right? My ServiceNow bill is more than the bill of the outage, right? So we are used as a front end to ServiceNow, right? All of those events, we correlate, and we produce two or three ServiceNow incidents. We have an incident ITSM methodology. Those incidents get into ServiceNow. So they're like, okay, yeah, we'll use Selector as a, uh, as a ServiceNow front end. It's, 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 they use it for more, but this is the reason why they, they, they selected us. Well, ServiceNow is not going to do correlation. They don't. Actually. It's just going to fire up. And anyway, it's not convenient for them from a cost point of view to do correlation. Yeah, it's not, right? They better event more money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why would. So, what's that article, uh, The Innovator's Dilemma? That company which is successful on certain things, they will not do anything which will kill their business model. Correct. Right? Startups like us, uh, that's why we are there. And then we are um, customizable. What, what I mean by that is. Um, even though it's a networking use case, the core platform, if you look at, I, like I've spoken a lot today, I never used the words, BG, like I've used BGP and all that, but I never used core networking principles because the underlying platform, it is just producing data it, uh, and consuming data. It's, it's working in terms of math. It does, it is just independent of what um, the actual semantics of the data are. So we are able to customize using a solution engineering team, take the, take the platform and solutionize it in the, in, in the context of our customer. By the way, this is not a professional services engagement. It's part of our product offering, right? So we say this is a data scientist as a service or a solution engineer as a service. You get all of that as part of, of the selector service. You don't have to pay anything separate. So we, we do tailor everything in the context of a, of a customer. And then deployment flexibility we talked about uh, earlier, um, how uh, we can be deployed on premise, we can be deployed on their cloud premise, uh, on, our, on our cloud, or completely on a, on a VM or a set of VMs in the data center. So these are the capabilities that we've built and, and, and really have been very successful with, with folks. So I want to summarize here. Um, we are a Kubernetes native architecture. Uh, we adopted Kubernetes, it has helped us a lot. Um, elastic scale out, don't have to reinvent the wheel. Kubernetes have solved a lot of the uh, important problems for us. We are built on top of that. We do allow for a lot of network centric observability use cases uh, where uh, we do routing analytics, um, um, SDN, uh, uh, SD-WAN analytics, application analytics. A lot of it is use cases that are network centric. And then finally, as I said, we are tailored for um, customers, right? We, we, we say solution engineering and data scientist uh, as a service. A question about data sources still. We keep coming yeah. back to this, at least in, in from you, <laughs> right? Um, we talked about logs versus metrics versus metadata. What about parts and things of the network or, that can impact you that you don't control? Right, so talking about internet performance or those types of things, like is there any consideration or any thought to how those things get integrated into yeah. the analysis process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
believe it or not, there are experts in that space. Let's take Thousand Eyes, right? Thousand Eyes will give you a very accurate view of what your WAN connectivity looks like or what your internet connectivity looks like. Kentik is another, uh, another example. We integrate with their insights. So all of these products have an API access or even a streaming access into the insights that they manufacture so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Right? And customers don't want us to reinvent the wheel because they've already deployed these established products in this space. And if Selector comes in and says, hey, we do all of these things, they're like, why would I pay you to do this? You know, I already have, I'm paying a lot of money to these companies. I'm very happy with them. Right? You need to fill in the gap that these guys are not able to do. So for stuff like that, which is outside the network, we integrate with existing uh, solutions. And the good news is these solutions are uh, very modern and they provide great API access into the insights they produce. And, and they, they have a lot of software integrations that they were built in because they were born in a day and age where integrations with other software systems is very important, right? So for them, for a, for a company like Kentik to integrate is, is, is a good thing for us. As you said at the beginning of this, uh, for the time being, you're focused on network devices, network events. With what you're doing with tagging metrics and logs and, and turning those into correlated events, is there potentially a security play here in the future, pulling in uh, that information from security infrastructure and then correlating and saying, hey, you may have an issue here, here, and here? Yes, yes and no. Um, there's definitely a play with security. Uh, the, the, the issue, not the issue, the, the requirements of a security play, a lot of audit requirements, um, uh, long-term storage, uh, and, and stuff like that. So what, what we are planned, in, at least in the next uh, two, two to three years, is to integrate with SEM and source systems and make use of their, make, make use of their analytics. Okay. That makes sense. To talk a little bit about the, the chat and you know communicating with Collector, we saw that Joe made a configuration change that potentially caused an issue. Can you interact with the chat and say, what is the change that Joe made? Yes. Was this change approved through a change request, things like that? Yes, yes, yes. So um, I, 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 didn't, I didn't have, so you can do two things. The configuration, so now that you know Joe, Joe made the change. Joe's changes are also sitting in a data store inside the platform. So you can query, so you can say, show me all the changes made by Joe in the last 10 hours, right? All of those will show up on your platform. That's, that's number one in which you can still stay on Slack and you can get all that information. So this is an example Damn. of the correlation graph. Of course the system, we're not gonna expose this to the user, right? This is, the, this is the correlation graph the system built from all those events that happened and then, at, and it's all rooted at this, this information. And this itself is, this is the, the real picture of the, the PowerPoint that I showed. And then if I were to click on this. So now you get a little more deep dive into, at that point in time, 942 to 1042, this is the state of the art in, in your system. And then this is where I go. I'll expand this. You can see this is what Joe did, right? Joe did this on L150. He, they set interface down, E114, and the username is Joe. So now you can, so this is, the, this is the query that's going on. Now you are in developer mode at this point in time. You're, you know exactly what's going on. Somebody is having a chat with Joe, but you want to find out more. As a, as an investigator, you can now play with this query over here and do different things. You can browse, browse around. Like, again, our, our experience is inspired by me as a developer. When I see a software crash, I have a core dump, and then I take the core dump, feed it into a debugger, and then you don't know what you're looking for. But a debugger gives you all the tools I can highlight on a variable. It tells me this is what happened over here. I'm looking. So the but the debugger tool has made it easy for me to browse for information, right? So once the alert has fired, our system, you can now browse for this information. This is one way. Now I, I know L150 is, so here, these are, this is all that happened. 
these are all the logs that got parsed and that got correlated at this point in time. And I can look at this log and I can see what this message looks like. Again, maybe there are millions of logs that are happening over there. I'm not inundated by any of that. And I'm able to see my logs right away. I'm able to see the, the application metric loss, like this, this information, as you can see, at this point in time, the configuration was happened. And this point in time at the bottom window, you can see packet loss between these two applications, right? This is the underlying metrics, right? This is the metrics that the correlator had access to, and it built that, it, it built that graph over there. When, when you said that that correlation graph wasn't, wasn't exposed to the end user, uh, are, you, are you just saying that it wasn't exposed like in Slack when the message yeah. was given? Like the consumer of your product can go to that page and yeah, look at that because I think there's a ton of things that could be learned. Yes, yes. Yeah. Looking at that when an event happens, yeah, yeah. maybe I don't fully understand right. how they got to this conclusion. Right. Let me look at all of, yeah. um, all of the events or all of the related metadata that would help me as a human kind of maybe train it a little bit yeah. better. Yes. Okay, so they do have access to it. It's yeah. just not the first thing they see. They're going to see something more natural. I'm just like used words. to saying that because as a startup, we, we built in phases. There was a point in our life, we would throw that at the user. Right. Right. And they were like, what is this? Right. So we worked on that. Mm -hmm. Like we worked on putting layers of software on top of that graph just so that you don't exp you're not exposed to that. You're exposed to that uh, chat message that we just saw. But that information is there. You, as I said, we went to the portal from the Slack message. You go to this portal. Depending upon what your privilege, uh, privileges are as a user, maybe read-only users might not have access to all the charts, but an admin, you sure. have access to all the When charts. you said that, I just didn't know if we were looking like at a dev version of this or something where we were... Where no, no, no. We so that's what a user will see if they click on it, yes. if, they have the, if they have the rights to do so. Yeah, yeah, yeah amazing. Yeah, yeah. And that's really important because, I mean, especially for all of us sitting in the room here, we're engineers. So we, we don't just have blind trust. We always want to understand yes. Yes. how something was determined. We want to know what's going on kind of behind the scenes. Right. And, and that's been generally a challenge in, in our industry of getting people to adopt automation or AI or ML is that kind of feeling of giving up control. Right. But the more you can reassure that as I look at that, like this makes a lot of sense to me. This is, this is putting together and connecting the dots that I would have done manually. Yes. It's going to instill confidence in the outcome. Yeah, yeah. And it's still going to help though, because maybe you want to see all of it because you want to, you want to know how, was it, how it was correlated. But some other user that is just getting the alert and wants to know the, the quick details saying, we'll just look at Slack. I have a ton of world managers and people of hope that they simply come to me. I don't care about it. I only want the sausage and this is what you're going to give me. Don't, don't give me the details. Just simplify it. Mm -hmm. So it is addressing more than one, well, audience. Yes. And the intent is clear. You want to know more? Get here. But this is what you need, at least if you want to keep yourself informed of what's happening. Mm -hmm. I think it's a valuable thing. Those 247 people I sh showed on chat in the earlier other channel, all of those 247 people are never going to go to the portal. But maybe five of them are. Right? Because Joe. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Including Joe. Joe. Joe's too busy at HR, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so out of those 247 people, five people want to go to the Slack channel, right? And you should see... Other Slack channels where we have engineers, they don't issue natural language queries. They know exactly what they want for. They issue this long queries and they get their data because they've learned and learned the platform. They understand uh, what the query language looks like. And just, just a thing, people ask me, why did you call the company Selector, right? And, and the reason for that is um, our data is uh, exposed using a SQL query. We, we felt that SQL is a good uh, query language, but lets you query any kind of information, right? There's no need to invent a new query language. SQL is there. Let's just use SQL as our, uh, if you look at our queries, they look very similar to SQL. SQL, the most common statement is a select statement. Right? That's like if the first statement that you you say, what is SQL? A lot of this is select. So that's how we call ourselves selector um, and just distribute. So, so we've seen what you do. Yeah. Uh, super, super interesting, but I want to know what you think is coming. So what, what's next? Yeah. Um, so, so three things. So three things, um, um, because being the CTO, I have a chartered uh, sure. a roadmap for our company for the next two years. So first thing I still feel, um, we want to get to a, 
I, I want to say a self-service model, but not self-service in the typical log into a portal, create an account, not in that kind of fashion. Today, our solution engineers have to do a lot of background YAML coding to set this up. We, we have an internal language, which we call selector meta language, S2ML. We use GitOps to deploy all of that. There's a lot of CI CD that happens. So it's still code oriented. It's not code as in, C code or Python code, it's still YAML code, but code is still code. I want to get, the first thing I want to get to is the platform should be stood up completely via the portal. Uh, completely, right? I can point and click things and the stuff will happen. You don't have to go, go into, log into a machine and do anything. Simplicity, everything has to be a point and click. That's number one. Number two, we want to address, uh, um, now that folks are used, uh, the, the more predictive use cases, right? Forecasting, is a different area of machine learning and AI that we want to get into, right? We, don't, we didn't start with forecasting right away and start using predictive technologies because A, you need to understand more a little bit about your customers, what is it that they're trying to predict. Uh, so uh, we, this year, we are going to be focusing on just forecasting. And, and there are different kinds of forecasting uh, that are interesting to customers. They were, this, they, on this WAN link, uh, it's going to get saturated in the next 40 days, right? So how do you get to that right away, right? Uh, or there are so many, so if somebody's provisioning VLANs on an interface, you know, today you have 10 VLANs on an interface, likely in the next quarter, you're going to get to 2,000 VLANs or some, some number of VLANs on this interface. At that point, you need to be moved to a different port. So uh, forecasting along those lines, um, Biggest forecasting thing is um, people are doing multi-cloud networking, right? So when you do multi-cloud networking, you have to deploy a lot of uh, routing constructs in cloud providers. You'll deploy a transit gateway. You'll deploy a, a load balancer service. You always start cheap because you don't know how whatever you're doing, is it going to uh, stick or not? And you're also trying out. So you don't want to pay for a transit gateway that can hold so many routes. You'll start with this kind of routes. Of course, when you deploy it, you forget about it, right? And your service <laughs> sticks. Your service sticks. And suddenly, your transit gateway just keels over and die. It's not AWS's fault because, hey, that's what you paid for. And you just forgot about it. And you need to, you need to deploy a bigger transit gateway. You need to pay AWS a little bit more, right? Selector is going to predict uh, that, hey, transit gateway capacity is going to run out in the next, whatever, 50 days, you better start getting that budget approved so that uh, you can deploy the next level of transit gateway. Yeah, so that predictive... Would be, uh, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Everybody yeah. tries to get the budget approved in the last minute rather than... Right. <laughs> and, and most, like, we've had a few outages where the the reason not we as in our customers have an outage they they just forgot that they had deployed this transit gateway and they're just trying out this thing how does this cloud on ramping work i'll i'll run some applications over there <laughs> and of course it runs great and then everyone's happy and then keep keep getting users into it and then they have an outage mm -hmm. so prediction is is one of the things that we want to do um, this year so i got self service model more predictive use cases and 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 as I said, uh, so as a startup, I only have an intuition as to this is what we want to do. But we always build with customers. Right? Mm. If you build in a vacuum, you will build something which nobody's going to use, or you you're not able to tailor. So we want to get into in one uh, in this year adjusting networking cases, uh, use cases like Kubernetes networking. Like I, as I said earlier. Kubernetes is a complex network running under the covers. If we can do this kind of correlation over here, we can do it in, over there as well. But we need to, we, we want to build this with a customer partner who actually runs a fairly large size Kubernetes network so that we can learn from them. So that's one, one thing that we want to do. Um, we want to get into multi-cloud networking, right? And m my belief is a vendor cannot build an analytic solution. If I am a manufacturer of certain thing, whatever, pick a laptop, pick a router or a switch, the manufacturer of that piece of thing cannot build the analytic solution. They just cannot. They think they can, but they will never have the resources to build the analytics layer on top. Because building analytics 
and observability requires resources, it requires effort, and they will never have the budgeting dollars to shift away budgeting dollars from what they are building to the analytics layer. And it is always second, second thought. Number one, anywhere that, that piece of equipment is deployed, there will be a bunch of other manufacturers also. So whoever is the customer, they will never trust an analytics solution from a vendor. And this is the reason I started Selected, because at Juniper, I could not, I could, but it would not be used. They'll say, oh, you'll always be partial to Juniper. They'll never trust me as that. So now, multi-cloud networking is along, going along those lines. So you have multi-cloud networks from company A, company B. We, we, we know that. That's the, that's the thing these days. My belief is these multi-cloud networking companies will never have a robust analytics solution. So company like Selector will be that analytics observability layer on top of multi-cloud networks, right? That's another use case that we want to go after. Uh, maybe this year, maybe multi-cloud networking this year is still nascent. It'll take a few, few more years to stick. That's the, the next use case we want to go after. It seems to me like with all of the information that you're gathering, digital twins, uh, might be something kind of on the right path. Yes, yes. We we uh, explored digital twins um, initially, and the reason I I, I want to say no, we're not going after digital twins in the traditional sense. Um, it involves a lot of deep understanding of what you are the twin of, right? So if 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 I decided I wanted to be a digital twin of a data center fabric, right? That's good business, it's a very hard problem to solve, but then means I have to invest completely in being a digital twin of that thing, right? It's, you have to become an expert there. So I'm not sure as a, as a company, I wanna tie myself down to a, a given flavor. Right? That's my honest opinion, but it might change. Um, but that's the reason why we initially thought of doing digital twins, I'm like, no, it requires a lot of expertise. And then you'll be that company forever. And I've seen for certain companies uh, who've been on that path, I, they have never been able to transition to a different uh, vertical. That's why a lot of money there and they can make a lot of money. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Have you seen any of your customers take data or alerts that they're getting out of this platform and use that? Um, as information to take to vendor support if they're having issues all the time. It, to, to prove, hey, we are having a problem here and here's the data that yeah, shows Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Like, Is there a good way to export that to, to take to vendor support cases or, or anything? How would they do that? So um, for that, it requires a certain amount of automation on the vendors to expose the APIs into their uh, uh, their support uh, support system. Well, even not an automation thing that you have a case open. You're actively working with a support individual. Or do provide I provide a PDF or something? Yeah, yeah. That yeah. Was the yeah. Happens, right. So if you service providers have outages, a couple of them that we worked with, and they are the usual vendors. You know, C A. <laughs> usual vendors and if there's an outage call every vendor is like not my fault not my fault it's, you know it's the it's the one link it's a load balancer it's that and then our our, our customer says selector is saying the load balancer went down right so you, mr f vendor you are you are responsible you have to prove to me that this thing is red why is it red show me the logs of your device and show me what selector is saying that this went bad, you need to prove to me, right? And this gets, selector gets, as I said earlier, in the, in the blameless post-mortem, it's never blameless though, um, uh, blameless post-mortem, uh, we get used a lot so that the, the vendors can be, and, the, and vendors also uh, sometimes appreciate this help, right? Because I've been on the vendor side at Juniper and when I get hauled up and say, hey, the router crashed, this line card crashed, the first thing I want is, okay, can you tell me what happened around that time? Uh, what piece of code got triggered? Uh, if you could just give me all of that information, I'll get to the root cause um, faster, right? So vendors appreciate the information that we're able to provide to them, right? We, we give them that, hey, these were the logs that were seen by these particular routers around that time. These were your metrics. This is what they looked like. 
so we, we've had a lot of success uh, with working with vendors as well. Earlier on, you mentioned, and we had a little bit of discussion around you know, APM and starting mm -hmm. to understand, that obviously, the, the business cares about the application, um, pulling application insights into the model. Obviously, there's other solutions out there that are trying to do correlation of, of broader infrastructure, say, in the data center. How do you maintain your focus or your strategy, understanding that, you know, boiling the ocean, trying to pull too much in and make sense of it usually doesn't result in the outcome we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And yet, obviously, the more context, the more data means the more meaningful yeah, yeah, yeah. outcome. So as I, as I said earlier, APM today is focused on how the application is behaving internally, not really around how the application is interacting with other pieces of inf things that the application needs to interact with. Mm -hmm. Our strategy and focus is going to be how that application works with other applications. So I don't have any intentions of building a Dynatrace killer or um, what is Jyoti's other company? I forget the name now. The first APM uh, thing that uh, was built, uh, I, I don't have any intentions of build that. Right. However, today, APM tools, how they interact with the databases, how they interact with the Postgres cluster, all of that visibility is completely absent, and, AP, and applications bring in a different flavor of that connectivity. There'll be a lot of HTTP requests, a lot, a lot of TCP retransmits. We want to get into that space, which is around connectivity, right? We don't want to get into uh, what an application does. Is this piece of code that has to be more efficient? Because APM tools in that space, they know more than us, and they they will figure out a way. Just like we don't compete with the solution that Arista builds to debug an Arista switch. We don't compete with the solution that Cisco builds to debug a Cisco switch because they have thousands of developers uh, at, who know more about that thing that we can potentially uh, possibly uh, figure out, right? So we, we, we don't want to go into deep into application monitoring as the term uh, means, but how an application works with its ecosystem we will uh, we'll go out of that space. Well, I think that's a smart move, though, or lack of movement, <laughs> because uh, it, it also happens that somebody comes up with a product that initially works well, and then they seem to try to cover all possible use cases, and then, well, you end up not doing any of them in both well, in the same depth that you would be doing the first one. Yeah, yeah. Knowing exactly what you would be good at and sticking with it, then you're going to be known for something, yes. which is different than, oh, they tried everything and they did one well out of yeah. 49 that sucked totally. Yeah. So I think it's excellent as well. I think you're defined as a person, as a company, on what you do not do rather than what you do, right? That, that, is, that is more <laughs> telling of you as a company that I choose not to do this. I will not do this. Not because of laziness or not because of that, uh, you know, you don't have the skills, because I want to focus on this particular thing this is what I'm going to do. So I, I'm a firm believer of identifying things that we will not do. Well, that's right. You, you simply need to know well, which battles to fight and what you do best. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so okay. If you were, if you were say, if you were God for a day, right, and you could force all the other network vendors to implement some sort of telemetry system um, by your definition to best help select your AI. What would you implement? What would you tell them to do or force them to do in this in this case? Okay, let me think. <laughs> Feels like an interview question. I was gonna yeah. say, no, no, totally. That's fine. Um, <laughs> so let let's let's take a vendor of a networking flavor, right? Because um, our, our networking flavor. My my ask of the vendors would be: make it easy for me to pick and choose. Right, uh, you need there needs to be a protocol. Maybe GNMI was that protocol, uh, but you you dis define a protocol by which an analytics system can interact with other devices. We've we've created BGP, we've created OSPF over the years. How routers and switches talk to each other. Today there is no protocol of how an analytics system like us talks with other things, right? So we need to first agree that a protocol needs to be built. Um, maybe it's GNMI, maybe it's not. And once that protocol has, is built, 
every part of that protocol is specified so that I know what the control workflow is and what, what the data workflow is. There is no RFC when it comes to this. So my ask of the vendors would be collaborate, let's build an RFC, let's build a protocol in which this information uh, exchange is more prescriptive, not open to interpretation, so that everyone will benefit from this. That would be, that would be my take if I were God. Would you hire him, Ed? <laughs> That's my test for sure. Great answer. Thank you so much. I think you could run for office on that platform. <laughs> Talking about running for office, uh, an interesting anecdote on that. People ask me, um, how was the, the company starting process like? Um, and, and, and my analogy to that was, it's almost like running for office, right? Because uh, when you pitch to investors, and you pitch to customers, are very different pitches, right? Investors, you, you have to pitch a certain way because you have to pitch the long-term vision, right? You cannot pitch tactical stuff. And if you pitch the long-term vision to a customer, they'll be like, get out of here, right? You got to, it's like almost like running for office. You need to run, you need to win the primaries and so that you, you gather one part of your base. And once you won the primary and won the nomination, you have to run as far away from that position <laughs> to a different position, <laughs> right? So that you can become president, right? <laughs> so same as when, when you when you get the you need the fee, you need the VC funding, you know you pitch a certain way. Once you get that, and it's not lying. It's not. I'm not trying to say that this is lying. It's perspective. It's, it's just different yeah. perspective, right? So you pitch to the VC a certain way, and once you start, you got the money, you start the company, you start pitching to customers. It takes a while to get to a different pitch mode, because you start with I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, and the customers are like, yeah, whatever. You need to be more grounded um, when you pitch to customers. So it's almost like running for office. <laughs>